Hello, everyone. Welcome to Systems at Scale. What a time for us to be getting together. This is a time when generative AI has unleashed a ton of innovation and activity across the tech landscape. Just the other day, I was on GitHub, and I was curious about the number of large language model-related projects that were out there. And it turns out there are over 100,000 projects, most of which were created in the last 12 months. If we look at something else, like data center buildouts, well, those are also progressing at an unprecedented rate. And many companies are racing to build larger and larger AI clusters. Taken together, this means we are going through a major change across multiple domains, data centers, systems, AI, and applications of AI. It's easy to feel like everything is changing at the same time. Some of you in the room might be wondering, what does this mean for me? What will development even look like a few years down the road? How disruptive is generative AI going to be? And what can you or I do to stay ahead? Well, I'm here to tell you today that this AI revolution is powered by innovation in infrastructure that many of us in this room have been building for many years. What's more exciting is that the lines between AI and systems are yet to be drawn. We are in this phase right now where infrastructure is influencing AI, just as AI is influencing infrastructure. This is the kind of time where the most innovative work tends to happen, and you and I get to be a part of creating this future. Of course, AI is not a new area. Here at Meta, we've been pioneering AI for ranking and recommendation systems for products like Newsfeed for many years now. But generative AI has been a watershed moment. It is reminiscent of other watershed moments like the start of the mobile computing era. I can tell that's the case by the palpable energy, which we only see during this uncertain time when a major disruption is about to happen. Much like mobile computing, Generative AI has also questioned a bunch of our assumptions, and now we are building systems for AI first. Let's talk about some of the trends that are driving this system's innovation. The first is a volume of training data. We are in this phase in generative AI now, where more and more training data is unlocking new capabilities for the models. It's also not just one kind of model, there is a huge diversity of use cases when we're looking at Gen AI. And last but not least, remember those ever-growing AI clusters? There is an insatiable demand for compute that can serve all these diverse use cases and use this huge amount of training data. Combined together, these are unlocking new capabilities for recognition and composition in these models and automating things that have never been automated before. It's important to keep one thing in mind, which is this generative AI training problem maps almost perfectly to a giant interconnected mesh of GPUs, where every GPU exchanges data with every other GPU in the interconnected mesh, and does so periodically and repeatedly. With this context about the trends, now let's talk about some of the systems areas where we're innovating. And I'm going to talk about these by going over three parts of the model lifecycle. I'll start with training, then talk about model freshness, and finally talk about model serving and inference. Let's start with model training. Training, at its core, is a stateful service, which stores state either locally or remotely, and whenever a failure happens, copies state over and resumes the training operation. At Meta, we've been building infrastructure for training for many years now. But as the number of GPUs grows, we've been looking at the throughput of the training operation. The aspiration, of course, is that throughput scales linearly with the number of GPUs. As you can all imagine, that is not what happens in practice. So now let's break this problem down and look at it in more depth. One of the measures we use here is what we're calling effective training time. And really, the inspiration here is to make sure that we are making as efficient use of our GPU clusters as possible. Why do you think this is important? Well, when we were running training operations on 8, 16, or 64 GPUs, a single GPU failing meant that 64 GPUs would be stalled until the system was ready to resume the training operation. 
Now think about a cluster with 24,000 GPUs. That's a lot of expensive GPUs waiting around for the training operation to restart. As such, it's really important that we improve effective training time. This is a great example of an area where systems innovation is unlocking progress in AI, because without improving EFT, we will never be able to train these models. Now let's look at what the biggest detractors are to effective training time. I'm going to touch on two of these. The first is hardware failures. Even if a GPU has an MTTF of two years, that means when there are 24,000 of these together, we are looking at roughly 1.3 failures every hour. The unfortunate reality is, when you have a very large number of GPUs, the probability of one GPU failing goes up, and the cost of one GPU failing also goes up. This is an area where we are partnering with NVIDIA, and you're going to hear directly from Julie in a talk just after this. The main area where we've been focused on on the software side is around recovery speed the time it takes to recover the training operation after a failure occurs. In this area, there are three main areas of focus. First, the amount of time it takes the system to actually realize that a failure has happened. The second is the amount of time it takes to restart the training operation. And the third is the amount of lost progress when a failure happens. Let's talk about how we can optimize number two and number three. First, let's talk about restart optimizations. This is the end-to-end -end time between one host realizing that the training job needs to restart to the last host re-entering the training loop in the next iteration after the failure has happened. As you can imagine, we profiled this entire operation and found where the major bottlenecks were. And as you might expect, there are a number of areas that we can optimize. For example, we can reduce the total cost of initialization inside Nickel. We are also looking at reducing the cost of our own container restart process. When the training cluster sizes are small, it turns out that the container restart time is really not something that we need to worry about too much. But at large cluster sizes, it starts to become quite a big deal. By building something that we are calling consistently fast container restarts, we've been able to reduce the overhead of container restarting from minutes down to seconds. Our overall approach here is to over-allocate hosts to the training job. This means we have a set of hosts that are pre-warmed, they're already running the training entry point, but they're not part of the training job quorum. Now, when a failure happens, we can simply restart the containers in place and wait for quorum to be re-established. As soon as that happens, the training operation can resume. And training quorum includes these warm spare hosts and explicitly excludes the host that failed in the previous iteration. Through these restart optimizations, we expect to be able to make a big dent in EFT. Now let's talk about lost progress due to failures. The optimization that we are looking at here is increasing checkpoint frequency. Of course, checkpoint operations themselves are expensive, and they would detract from EFT. So the optimization that we are looking at here is to make the checkpointing operation asynchronous by copying state from GPU memory to CPU memory and allowing the checkpointing operation to happen largely in parallel with the training job continuing to make progress on GPUs. This, we expect, will reduce the duration of checkpoints from the order of 2 to 4 seconds down to tens of milliseconds. And this means we can take checkpoints much more frequently. This in turn means that the amount of repeated work after a failure occurs can be dramatically reduced. This we also expect will make a big improvement to EFT. Even though I talked so much about hardware failures and recovery speed, the truth of the matter is these all have diminishing returns. At the end of the day, when there's a gigantic cluster full of GPUs, stopping the entire training operation for one GPU doesn't make a ton of sense. No one can ever get to the moon by climbing taller and taller trees, can they? I fully expect that over time, the model algorithms themselves will evolve, and we will have models that are intrinsically resilient to single GPU failures. 
Now that we talked about training for quite a while, now let's switch gears a bit and talk about model freshness. And it is related to training because after all, a trained model is only as valuable as the data that was used to train it. When it comes to model freshness, there are also a wide variety of use cases. There are some models, like the generative AI ones, that can be refreshed every few months or weeks and it's all right. On the other hand, for ranking models, typically these benefit from being refreshed every hour or even in the order of minutes. And at the far extreme, we have the Instagram Reels recommendation models, where certain item embeddings, if we could refresh those every five or 10 seconds, there tends to be a significant upside. You might wonder why that is the case. And this is because model freshness is key to relevance. For example, when you're looking at a set of reels and you're in the mood to see some cooking videos, well, you want to make it such that the system serves you more and more videos related to your interest within that same user session. Model freshness, however, is not free. Some of these models are really large. They're hundreds of gigabytes or tens of terabytes in size. And in order to refresh them frequently requires complexity, cost, as well as has some safety implications in some cases. Let's talk about this in some more depth. As you can imagine, with any systems optimization problem, we started with the simple things first. At Meta, we already have a large-scale, network locality-aware, peer-to-peer sharing system. And that's what we use also for model freshness. We also looked at some optimizations to reduce the size of the model snapshot. These taken together already made it possible for us to refresh models every two hours or so. When we wanted to go beyond that to an hour or below one hour freshness time, we started to look at delta snapshots. The online training system is constantly using real-time data sources to record what people are doing inside the meta family of apps. Every 15 minutes or so, post-training takes a snapshot of the 10% of the most important model parameters and then computes a delta snapshot of the model with updates to just those parameters. Creating this delta snapshot significantly reduces the size of the model that needs to be updated. Once again, we use the same peer-to-peer -peer distribution system, and then we go apply this delta online to the model while it's serving live traffic. Now let's look at the step beyond that. Beyond that, we are looking at a paradigm shift, because now we're looking at streaming. Instead of waiting for a consistent snapshot of the model, as the elements of the tensor update, we stream those in near real time to production and apply them to the model live. The reason this is a paradigm shift is because the models are generally not designed today to arbitrarily update components of the model in near real time. This is an area where our industry peers in ByteDance, and you're gonna hear from a speaker at ByteDance later today, have been leading the way and they've been balancing freshness with safety. They have a system that detects whenever the model update is unsafe and has a way to roll that back gracefully in production. This is another area where as the systems change and become capable of streaming these updates with reasonable complexity and reasonable cost, I fully expect that model authors will change the algorithms to take maximal advantage of these streaming capabilities and make it so that we can serve much more relevant content to people using our apps. Now let's switch gears and talk a bit about inference. Inference is an exciting multivariate problem. As I'm sure you all know, with inference, one of the most important things is latency. You talk to a chatbot, you expect it to reply back to you, and the faster it replies back, the better it generally is. However, latency is not the only thing that we care about during inference we also care deeply about efficiently using the expensive GPUs. It is a well-known fact that GPUs are not just expensive to acquire. Their roadmap is also evolving very rapidly. As a result, most of us have many different generations of GPUs across our global data center footprint. But it's not just the underlying hardware that is diverse. The use cases are also very diverse. Different use cases have different latency SLAs. 
there are also models that have specific dependencies on specific versions of GPU hardware. Last but not least, model size is an important criterion here. For example, remember those models that are tens of terabytes in size? Well, those can only be deployed on specific kinds of GPU hardware. If you combine all this together, you have a fascinating resource management problem with a diverse set of demands for GPUs and a diverse set of supply that can meet those demands. This is another area where we are leaning on our techniques for building solvers. Today, we have solvers that do optimal compute and data placement for stateful services. And we are using the same solver system to optimize inference and model placement. I also want to touch briefly on distributed inference. Some of these models are so large that they cannot fit inside HBM for a single GPU node. As a result, we are splicing these models into multiple parts. And here, too, we need to balance between latency and making efficient usage of the underlying GPU hardware. At the end of the day, once we figure out how to really optimize for efficiency as well as for latency, this will open up entirely new model use cases, like truly conversational agents that can participate in group discussions. Imagine discussions where a bunch of human beings, we are talking to each other, and we are also talking to several AI agents at the same time. In closing, I want to leave you with three things from today's Systems at Scale opening talk. One is that we are at the start of a tectonic shift in the tech landscape. This AI revolution is powered by innovation in infrastructure systems that many of us have been building over many years. And last but not least, the future is yet to be created. We are at this exciting time where the lines between AI and systems are yet to be drawn. We are seeing this exciting phase where systems are influencing the models and then the models are influencing the systems. These are the times when the most exciting and innovative work tends to happen. And you and I get to be a part of creating this exciting future. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy all the talks that we have lined up for you today, all in the realm of AI and systems. Thank you.